All right. So, Hossein, do you have any words uh, to start? Um, just welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining in today on this uh, special day. And I look forward to um, our presentation today that will include the question and answer and discussion. Okay, very good. All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share the screen and... Um, okay. Okay, good. All right. Okay, very good. So I wanted to begin by showing you some more images. And so um, last time, remember, so we've been talking about the, the first sermon um, and also the second sermon. First sermon is, is when the Buddha presents the Four Noble Truths for the first time. And the second one is um, when he talks about the characteristics of the self or the characteristics of non-self. And there's some very um, beautiful sculptures of Buddha um, delivering the first sermon. So um, Sarnat was the location of the first sermon. And Sarnat is then later in, in the 19th and 20th century became a major archeological site where they discovered many, many beautiful works of art and sculptures. And this one in particular dates back to about the fifth century, so the 400s AD. And it shows, this depicts the Buddha delivering the first sermon. Um, maybe I'll zoom in a little bit more, get some detail here, if we can. And so um, the image itself, so most people probably know that um, statues of the Buddha usually, well, they, they all, um, include some gesture or some, some hand gesture or positioning of the hands, which is called a mudra, M-U-D-R-A, a mudra. And different gestures mean different things. And this is the standard gesture that shows him delivering the first sermon because it's supposed to represent him turning a wheel. So he's holding a wheel, a small wheel in one hand, and he's turning it with the other hand. And so this is, this represents setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. And you see this, um, this big halo behind him, actually, um, halos that came to be, that were depicted in European religious art actually originated in India um, with images of the Buddha. So this is a halo and um, on both sides of the halo, we have celestial beings who have come down, descended to listen to the Buddha deliver the sermon. On his right side and left side, we have um, image, images of gazelles or deers because the place he gave it was a, was an animal refuge. It's, it's the deer park, the um, at Sarnat, and then at the very bottom, we have the five ascetics here, who were his first audience. Um, they're represent, and here is the wheel. So they're they're um, here. You see a side view of the wheel as it's turning, and they're listening, and then. On the far left is a woman and her child. So a mother, a mother. And who would this be? Well, probably the donor or the, the donor um, of the statue to the monastery that existed at that location at that time. Um, so, um, so this is one image I wanted to show of the first sermon. Um, there's another one, um, a little bit later one uh, from Indonesia, and this is from the famous temple um, in Indonesia, the temple of Borobudur. Borobudur, it's spelled B-O-R-O-B-U-D-U-R, -O -O -U -U temple, Indonesia, 7th century AD, and here you see the Buddha. Um, now he's in, I mean, interesting, this, this mudra shows him meditating, not preaching, not actually preaching. So he's meditating before he begins to preach. 
And these are the five ascetics, his five, his five friends with whom he practiced asceticism, who, um, who were the audience for the first sermon. And this is a picture of this temple. It's an amazing temple. It's um, a UN World Heritage Site in central Indonesia on the island of Java. And it's huge. You can see how, how gigantic it is. And also incredibly well preserved because it was kind of lost in the jungle until the 19th century, rediscovered in the 19th century. And you see all these terraces and um, along their walls along these terraces and these walls, all these, these walls are filled with sculptured reliefs that tell the story of the Buddha. And um, so this is really an amazing temple. And then you see the stupas up here um, at the top and then one huge stupa at the very center at the top. Um, so that's where that uh, relief comes that I showed you just a minute ago. Um, let me just, I need to close some tabs here, I think. And we'll, yeah. So, and then what, there's one other thing I wanted to draw to your attention. So this is a handout I'll ask Kosen to send you um, later this week, this week, maybe uh, Monday or Tuesday. And so you have all these links on this handout. And there's one other link that I want to especially draw your attention. So since, since the Buddha's birthday is coming up, there is a wonderful video of a, um, of a temple in Sri Lanka that has all these beautiful murals that depict the legend of the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, um, going back to his birth. And I'm see if I can find this. Um, and it has a it has a narrative. Um, it's narrated by I don't know who the guy is. He has a heavy German accent, but he gives a very wonderful description of this. Um, um, of these murals. If I can move it along here. He was evolving. So like this is life. actually depicting the birth of the Buddha. Um, and you see here is his mother, um, Queen Maya, I think, yeah, Maya, um, who um, is traveling to her parents for the birth, but is goes into labor before she arrives, and so uh, has to get out of the carriage. And she stands; she delivers him standing up, holding on to the branch of a tree. And he comes out of her side. She comes so so um, he's not defiled in any way by the birth canal. He comes out of her side. Here he's received by um, this person, and then. After and and Hosan talks about this in the email she sent out, the, the newsletter she sent out announcing the celebration of Buddha's birthday. So he's he's received by is actually divine beings who then bathe him, bathe him to wash him off, and then he stands up and and takes seven steps. So he's already able to walk the moment he's born, and he stands up and take seven steps, seven steps, and you see that they're, 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 the footprints are kind of uh, marked here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you can count them. And then on the seventh step, and this here he's taken the seventh step, he roars his lion, lion roar and declares that he is the, um, the great enlightened being um, of the world. I can't remember the exact, the exact words, but, um, so this is a wonderful video. So um, once again, you'll have to the link to this um, that I'll send out, or hope Hosen will send out to you this week. Um, okay, and here we go. Okay, so we're back with, yeah. So we wanted to um, today, devote today to just some questions and discussion. Um, since um, the last three sessions, we really kind of spent, I've, I've done most of the talking and 
and have um, we've read some suttas together, but I think um, now we have quite a bit of material that um, you probably have some some ideas and some questions that you want to make. And I thought I actually would begin uh, by going back to a question that Frank asked last time, or it was really a comment. And um, this relates to, it really sort of relates to the first sermon where the Buddha delivers the Four Noble Truths. And at the end of the sermon, it says that one of the ascetics became fully enlightened, you, Frank. But, but- You're right on, John. Okay. But that, when he said that, it reminded me of this description that we get of the Buddha many, many times in many different suttas that is sort of a stock description of, of him and very often is, um, is given at the beginning of a description of the path. Um, and so this is just one, one um, sutta where we have this description and it's actually one that I think we'll, haven't decided what we'll do next week, but it's, it's one I'm considering reading uh, together next week because it does give us a fairly concise description of all of the all the different aspects of the path, including meditation and conduct, and um, and um, right view and so on and so forth, wisdom. And so here's what it says: It says, a realized one arises in the world, perfected, a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, knower of the world supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. He realizes with his own insight, this world with its gods, Maras and Brahmas, his population with its ascetics and Brahmins, gods and humans, and he makes it known to others. So that's the key statement. He realizes with his own insight, this world, and he makes it known to others. He teaches Dhamma that's good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, meaningful and well phrased so it's it's eloquent and he reveals a spiritual practice so a discipline that's entirely complete and pure so this is the standard description of the buddha that we get in many many suttas and if we just look at this we'll see that you know it does indeed declare that he's fully awakened fully enlightened that he um, is really omniscient right he he has he realizes with his own insight, with this world containing everything. And traditionally, even going back to the earliest times, Buddha was considered to be not just awakened, but omniscient. And he makes it known to others and so forth. And so um, what, does this, what does this mean? Well, I think this, I mean, this might explain why, for one thing, why the Buddha was so per pervasive, persuasive, sorry, and namely that he talked about what he had experienced himself. He talked about what he had experienced himself. So he wasn't speculating about things, but he was talking about what he knew. And we all know that when we listen to someone, we get much more from someone who's actually experienced what they're talking about than from someone who's just read about it or seen a video about it or something like that. And so this may well be the reason why the Buddha was so powerful and so persuasive and, and that people could become awakened just upon hearing him giving a discourse. So I thought I'd put that out there as sort of um, one, I don't know, one way of looking at this. Frank, do you have any, um, anything to say about that? I'm really glad you expounded on that, John. Um, the other piece that I alluded to is when they say teacher of gods, okay? Mm -hmm. now they, you know, they have another name for that later on. Um, mm -hmm. Devas, you know. And so yeah. I was reading one of the texts from somewhere. Um, I know it was a Theravadan text where they talked about Buddha being the teacher of the devas. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard it. It was about eight years ago. And it just totally blew me away. The thought that I missed that all this time, because that's really significant. And it has something to do too, I thought was, um, they say that there's a certain kind of realization that you can have in the physical body that you can't have 
is a deva. Uh huh. Do you know anything about that, John? Yeah, there is there there is this um, idea that's found in different um, Indian spiritual traditions that that to be born as a human is a, a great blessing because it's possible. It's really possible, only possible to become fully enlightened as a human. And the reason for that is that um, humans are consciousness, conscious enough and intelligent enough to be able to understand and be able to practice a, a, a path of liberation. Um, and the gods, of course, are far more intelligent than, than humans, but their life is so pleasant and enjoyable that they're never motivated to practice the path <laughs> to, to attain enlightenment. And so that's why, so we, and of course, we also, we are exposed to all, you know, we'll talk about suffering in a minute, but we're, we're it's revealed, you know, it's, it's easiest for us to comprehend that everything is dukkha, whatever that means. Everything is, um, you know, suffering or uncomfortable or unsatisfactory or, you know, however you want to translate that word, but it's not possible for devas to understand that. And so the devas, as you saw depicted in the sculpture, the celestial beings who are, who are coming down to hear the Buddha deliver the first sermon. And when he speaks the first noble truth that everything is, is dukkha, they're probably kind of scratching their heads and saying, well, what is he talking about? <laughs> we just, uh, we don't get that. Exactly. But, but, the, but the five ascetics who are here, who are here you know, the five human ascetics, they can get that one. They can get that one. Although Buddha also emphasizes that this is the most difficult truth for people to accept, that everything is dukkha. We don't want to believe this. So we can, we can, we, we ought to believe this, but we don't, we, most people don't want to believe this. They want to believe that happiness is possible. So, um, so there's, there's this, um, this idea. Okay. So the Buddha, you know, he, so he was able, you know, he was this um, incredible teacher. I mean, that's, that's, emphasized over and over again he, he he practiced you know he knew how to one thing that's said of him frequently is he was very good at tailor tailoring his teaching to the individual student and he knew, knew exactly what a student needed um, in order for him to progress towards enlightenment and so sometimes this is referred to as his skill in means his skillfulness as a teacher but then what happens when there's no buddha what happens when there's no Buddha? What, what happens when there's no one to guide us um, and to, you know, who is able to speak these words and uh, from, you know, on the, you know, from what he's experienced so that they have that impact on us. And the Buddha actually addresses this in another sutta. Now, this is from the, what's called the, Parinirvana Sutta, and the Parinirvana is the final nirvana of the Buddha. In other words, the passing of the Buddha. And so this is a sutta that tells the story of the death of the Buddha, so his fine, and his, his final acts and his final words. And this is found in another um, collection uh, another one of the collections of the discourses that we haven't looked into yet. And this is the collection of longer discourses. So this is a, a quote, much longer discourse than any of the ones we've read. And it's probably in, you know, if, you, if when it's printed out, it's about 40, 50 pages. And at the very end of this discourse, so this comes at the very end, you see that in Sutta Central, this, so this is the Bhikkhu Sujato, Bhikkhu Sujato tra um, translation. And it's divided into sections. And very, towards the very end, section 35, we have the section, um, the Buddha's last words. And he doesn't say much, but the first thing he says is then the, um, then the Buddha addressed Venerable Ananda. He says, now Ananda, some of you might think the teacher's dispens dispensation has passed. So his teaching is gone. Now we have no more teaching, or now we have no teacher. But you should not see it like this. 
The teaching and training that I have taught and pointed out for you shall be your teaching after your teacher, sorry. The teaching and training that I've taught and pointed out for you shall be your teacher after my passing. So he's talking here, the teaching is the Dhamma, the, that translates the word Dhamma or Dharma, and the training is the discipline. And so these, these discourses that I've given and which have been, even at that time, um, they were being preserved and handed down. Um, and this discipline, this um, whole system of practice that I have defined for you, for my followers, that will be your teacher. That will become your teacher. Um, and you can become awakened by uh, following um, the words of my discourses and the discipline. And so this is, and this is a very important passage for Buddhists. It's quoted um, very often. And um, it, it, you know, essentially it says that, my, that I have, um, I'm not, you know, I mean, one interesting thing here is that he, he doesn't name a successor. Okay? He doesn't name a successor. He says, well, you know, the, um, I anoint Ananda as my successor, or there were other very, um, very prominent, um, very distinguished disciples. Ananda was one, Sariputta was another, Mahamogalana was another. There were several of them who, um, whose, um, uh, whose teachings are also included or whose explanations of the Dharma are also included as discourses in the scriptures. But he doesn't, he doesn't declare that one of them is his successor. He says, there is my teaching. And of course, there are these other teachers who are able to expound and explain it beautifully. But the main thing is my teaching as it's been um, handed down and preserved in the discourses. And so that's what we do now that we don't have a Buddha to, um, to awaken us just by uttering his words. Any ideas about that? Um, okay. Um, okay, let's... Um, let's go to another question that came up last time. Um, Anna, Anna's not here today, but she asked a question um, about the word suffering, the word suffering. And she wanted to know, she, she said she had read some there somewhere that the Buddha had never used the word, never used the word suffering, never used the word suffering. And so I thought we would look at that a little bit. And, um, and actually, strictly speaking, that's correct. The Buddha didn't use the word suffering because he didn't speak English. And um, what the word that he used was this word dukkha, dukkha, and which is often translated as suffering. And so I thought that we could just actually begin this by looking at the entry um, for this word in the Pali English dictionary of the Pali, um, Pali text society. So this is the standard Pali English dictionary. And you can actually um, download it online. Um, the copyright has expired. It was published in something like 1925. And so it's public domain now. And you can find it, you can, if you just um, Google Pali English dictionary PDF, a, a PDF version will come up that you can download. There's also an online version that I think is a little, it's not as easy to use. But um, so the first thing is, so this is um, Dukkha, the first um, uh, um, first lines of the entry um, discuss the etymology of the word. We don't have to go into that, but the, the initial definition is here. It says adjective, A-D-J, -A adjective, unpleasant, painful, causing, causing misery, as opposed to sukha, 
pleasant. Okay, so that's that's the basic word. But then, then um, the next thing the authors of the dictionary say under B is really quite interesting, and I think the most important. And by the way, this entry, you see it goes on, it actually goes on for three pages. <laughs> so it's a very long entry in a dictionary, and they have a lot to say about it. But let's just read this next statement. They say, there's no word in English covering the same ground as dukkha does in Pali. Our modern words are too specialized, too limited, and usually too strong. Sukha and dukkha are ease and disease, but we use disease in another sense, or they're wealth and ilf from well and ill, but we have now lost the word ilf, or well being and illness. But illness means something else in English. We're forced, therefore, in translation to use half synonyms, no one of which is exact. Dukkha is essentially is equally mental and physical. Pain is too predominantly physical. Sorrow is too exclusively mental. But in some connections, they have been used in default of any more exact rendering. So what they're saying is these are the usual translations of dukkha, pain and sorrow. Um, and then they go on, Dis discomfort, suffering, ill, and trouble can occasionally be used in certain connections. Misery, distress, agony, affliction, and woe are never right. They are, they are all much too strong and are only mental and so on. So, um, so the basic meaning is, is pain. And then that's that, but that has sort of a physical connotation but there can also be a mental con connotation of, of suffering or misery. Um, and so, um, if you go on, it talks about you know, various, various uh, ways of translating the word in different contexts. As a simple sensation, it would be pain. Um, as a complex state, um, any worldly sensation, pleasure, and experience um, that may be a source of discomfort, and so on. So that's, um, that's how scholars have translated this word dukkha. And so very often you do find the translation suffering in, um, in translations of, Pali, of the Pali scriptures. But once again, the, I think the, the main takeaway from this entry is that the, the range of meanings is actually very broad. And so I actually think that the best way to, to try to understand a concept that you come across in in the suttas is to just read more suttas. I think the suttas sort of interpret themselves um, so that, um, and this, this term in particular, um, dukkha, well, we're looking at a different, um, a different sutta, but this term in particular, there, there are a, a number, quite a few suttas in the scriptures where the Buddha talks about dukkha. Okay, so the sutta that we read where we encountered this term dukkha, which, which was the first sermon, right? And also the second sermon, the first sermon, he, the first noble truth is that everything is dukkha, everything is dukkha. Um, I think our translation said suffering. Um, and then it, once again, it, it names these life experience, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering not to get what, what you want is suffering, being associated with the unpleasant is suffering, the five aggregates of attachment, or dukkha, I should say, I just should say dukkha. There's, these are all dukkha, okay? Um, but that doesn't really give you much information. I mean, that, okay, that identifies certain experiences as dukkha, certain experience, experiences that we know. But there are other discourses that are much more expansive ab about dukkha. And one of them that, that I, this is going to be on the handout sheet that will be sent out to you is the greater discourse on the mass of dukkha, Mahadukkha Kanda Sutta. This is in the middle discourses. So it's uh, Majjhima Nikaya 13, the middle discourse is 13. And in this sutta, it's, it's um, fairly long and the Buddha basically depicts the daily grind 
he depicts everyday life and how how annoying and and discouraging and disappointing and unsatisfactory it is. And he does this at great length. And so what you come, I'm actually not even sure he uses the word dukkha in this sutta, but what you come away with is that um, it's pretty clear that the Buddha thought that no matter what you do, happiness is not to be found in this mundane existence in the lives we're living now. True happiness is not to be found. And happiness is perhaps possible for someone, for someone who's practicing the path. And so this is just another, this is just one of many suttas where he discusses this idea of dukkha. It's something that he put great emphasis on in his teaching. And as I said before, it's something that he, and the reason he probably puts great emphasis on it is because he thought that it was something that was, that was very difficult for people to understand because they don't want to understand it. They don't want to understand it. Um, so um, that's what I had to say about this, the, the idea of Tuka. I have a comment, a comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, this week, I was working with a client. Um, I do counseling and psychotherapy using the system called dialectical behavioral therapy. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, John. Mm -hmm. It's based on Buddhist teachings. Marshall Lanahan, who went through that, became a Dharma teacher. And the significance that I found this week is we broke open, when you say pain, when somebody says, I'm in pain, they usually think of the physical. I noticed that was in the commentary you just read. But there's also simultaneous to that and a mental, emotional aspect of pain or dissatisfaction or suffering that sometimes we forget that we can either have a strong leaning towards the emotional, mental part Mm -hmm. as opposed to the physical part. Like for this, this is client I was working with. She has a, a knee pain. She's got to have a knee operation because her knee is blown out, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, it's rubbing, rubbing, bone against bone. And so a lot of times she's all for focused on the sensation of pain, but not realizing that she goes into varying degrees of emotional pain when she's preoccupied and feared yeah. and doubt of having more pain or it lasts more for a while, you know, emotionally and mentally, there's that interface where it's separate. There's certain, to manage it, you usually have to break it open so you can learn how to distract your mind from mm -hmm. the pain. And therefore you won't feel as much dukkha. You won't feel as much yeah. dissatisfaction yeah. when you're able to, you know, focus on something else mentally. Yeah, yeah. So these are these are different forms of dukkha, I think. Yeah, I think. right. Buddha would would say he would he would identify all of these experiences as dukkha. And so that's you're going to get more into that next when we get the handout from that. You say it's going to have expound on that more. A well, bit. I say the handout has the um, has the it doesn't have the link in that on the handout. I have I've um, given you this sutta to um, look up for yourselves, actually. You notice I say home study. So I oh, don't give you the link. I, this is a little exercise for you to do. See if you can find it. Okay. See okay. if you can find it and read it and then tell me what you think. Tell me what you think next time. Okay. And, um, and um, yeah, so that's that's just another, you know, as I said, it's, it's another text that gives you more content for this term. And there, there are many, many passages. And so that a lot of people, when they read, you know, this is the other point I, I wanted to make. A lot of people, when they read the Buddhist scriptures, think that, well, they're entirely pessimistic and happiness is impossible. <laughs> and the Buddha really doesn't, he doesn't say that either. He says that these five aggregates are dukkha. In other words, this physical human existence is dukkha, um, but there are other scriptures where he talks about the blessings of well, I mean, one uh, of the spiritual path and the different experiences of 
bliss and delight and joy that come with, you know, especially the practice of meditation, but also the perfection of, of right conduct. And one of these scriptures I would really like to read at the end, it's, it's, it comes, comes from the longer discourses, and it's a dialogue with a king who comes to the Buddha and wants to know, what's the whole point of this? Why should one become an ascetic? Why should one give up sensual pleasures to meditate and do all these things? You know, convince me that this is, this is use, useful. And on that occasion, the Buddha, in considerable length, I think, develops a, um, a picture of sort of the possibility of happiness through practicing path. But I think, I think it is safe to say that he doesn't think happiness is really possible um, in, the, in the, the mundane world, living a householder life. Didn't really think that was possible. Um, okay, let's, um, I, I think the other thing on the agenda today is we wanted to talk about Angulimala again. We want to get back to that. And I wonder if anybody has any comments or, or observations or questions about this. So to, if, you, if you do, if you have something to say, just unmute yourself and start talking and I'll find you. I'll, I'll identify you. Um, but as I said, I thought this is a, you know, this is of course the story of the thief who um, the Buddha converts when um, by telling him to stop doing what he's doing. Okay, there's this, this sort of, and there are these verses here that tell the story sort of at the beginning, tell this to this kind of give us this little episode. Um, and this, these verses are usually probably verses that were in circulation already at the time of the Buddha. So Buddha says, while walking ascetic, um, you say I've stopped and I have stopped, but you tell me I've not. I'm asking you this ascetic, how is it you've stopped and I have not? Angulimala, I have forever stopped. I've laid aside violence toward all creatures but you can't stop yourself from harming living creatures. That's why I've stopped, but you have not stopped. And then Agulimala says, oh, at long last, a hermit, a great sage, who I honor, has entered this forest. Now that I've heard your verse on Dhamma, I shall live without evil. So he's immediately converted. With these words, the bandit hurled, they hurled his sword and weapon down a cliff into a chasm, he venerated the Holy One's feet and asked him for the going forth right away. So he asked him to be, to be accepted as a disciple and a member of the Sangha, the, of the community. Then the Buddha, the compassionate great hermit, it says compassionate here, which is an important qualifier, teacher of the world with its gods. So here we have the gods again, devas is the, is the Pali word, said to him, come monk. And with that, he became a monk. So he just says, come follow me. Like Jesus says in the, Bi in the Bible all the time. People become, he just tells people, follow me. Um, and, and so that's all it takes. And the, you know, um, Angulimala is a monk and then he's accompanying Buddha on his, on his journey um, um, from one place to the next. Um, and then there's the story of, um, encountering the king who's alarmed to hear that Angulimala has come into the kingdom and then is amazed to see that Angulimala is sitting there with his shaved head and his um, ochre robe and begging bowl um, uh, quietly um, meditating as if he were you know a tamed a tamed wild elephant or something and so this is very impressive and then we have then we have I think one of the key um, parts of this story is where Anguli Mala encounters the woman having childbirth. That's why, you know, this is the Mother's Day theme in this sutta. And so let's just read that um, here. He says, um, then, whoop, then the Venerable Anguli Mala um, 
robed up in the morning, and taking his bowl and robe, entered Savati for alms. Then, he, as he was wandering indiscriminately for alms food, he saw a woman undergoing a painful obstructed labor. Seeing this, it occurred to him, oh, being suffer such filth. Oh, being such or suffer such filth, he says. Um, I don't know if that's really the right translation, but that's, um, I think that we'd have to look at the poly to see if we could come up with a nicer word. Um, <laughs> But anyway, that's, that's how, this is Bhikkhu Sujatu, a modern translation. Uh, that's how, that's the choice he makes. And then after wandering, so then he goes back and tells the Buddha about this. After wandering for alms at Savati, after the meal, on his return from alms round, he went to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and told him what had happened. The Buddha said to him, well then Angulimala, go to that woman and say this, ever since I was born, sister, I don't recall having intentionally taken the life of a living creature. By this truth, may you, may both you and your baby be safe. And Gulimala says, but sir, wouldn't that be telling a deliberate lie? For I have intentionally killed many, many living creatures. In that case, Angulimala, go to that woman and say this, ever since I was born in a noble birth, sir, sister, I don't recall having intentionally taken the life of a living being. So ever since I was born in the noble birth, in other words, ever since I became a follower of the Buddha and joined the Sangha, by this truth, may both you and your baby be safe. Yes, sir, replied Angulimala. He went to that woman and said, ever since I was born in the noble birth sister, I don't recall having intentionally taken the life of a living creature. By this truth, may both you and your baby be safe. Then that woman was safe and so was her baby. So he relieves her of her agony simply by declaring, you know, this truth, this uh, making this, making this statement. Um, and I guess one question I've always had when I read this is, well, what, what is going on here? What is this anyway? How does this happen? How does how does he do this? How does by how does he by making this statement of truth relieve her of her of her labor? Any ideas? Did anybody think about this or wonder about this? Yeah, um, this is Michelle here. Hi, Michelle. Hi, John. Sorry, I was that I had the time down wrong. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, this idea of the of the the power of truthful words is uh, very, it has held on. It's, it's often talked about. And um, it has to do with the purity of the intention and the purity of the practice. Mm -hmm. And so through the power of that, of having practiced truly and spoken truth, that is able to change the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. Exactly. And um, I mean, you're right. There are many. There are actually many instances of this in in Buddhist um, literature, and there's even a word for it. It's called a deed of truth, uh -huh. or an act or an act of truth. And we first first find them in the early Buddhist um, in, in the early Buddhist scriptures. But as you say, they they you know they're they continue throughout the entire tradition of Buddhism. And I think you gave a beautiful explanation of it. That it's it's the purity is able to transform the situation into something good, and um, so. Um, any other any other ideas about that? Um, there's actually I thought I'd then draw your attention, since I'm really you know I'm really here just to serve as a pointer. <laughs> I'm pointing you towards. Uh, the the discourses um, which will teach you. I am not your teacher, uh, but the discourses are your teacher. And so I, I'm constantly going to be referring you to other places in the scriptures that that um, illuminate um, what we've read, what we've read somewhere else. And so this this acts this text actually is contained in what are called the Jatakas. You see the word up here, Jataka, Jataka. And a Jataka 
is a story of uh, a previous life of the Buddha before he became Buddha, before he awakened. And there's actually a special uh, term that's used to refer to the Buddha before he became awakened. Does anybody know what that is? It's Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva. So the so these are the stories of the Bodhisattva. In other words, the person um, or the being, uh, because he's not always a human being in these stories, who eventually became fully awakened as the Buddha of our time, Buddha Shakyamuni. And there are 550 of these stories contained in the Buddhist scriptures. They're contained in, and I won't go back and um, sort of retrace our steps, but they're contained in the collection of discourses called, I think, the, the shorter discourses. But this is really a kind of a, a, a miscellaneous collection of discourses. It's actually the longest um, collection of discourses in, in the Buddhist scriptures. And so one of the divisions of the shorter discourses is um, the birth stories, the birth stories. So this is the 75th birth story, 75 out of 550. There are the many, many of them, and they're wonderful stories. They're wonderful stories. And really these stories are used probably more than discourses of the Buddha um, today to teach um, Buddhists different, um, you know, different teachings, especially teachings about conduct. Um, and so this is a story where I mean, we won't read it, we don't have time to read it, but it will be on the handout that I send out where Buddha is born as a fish, but it actually starts out where the Buddha is dwelling, you know, he, it's, it's the Buddha Shakyamuni who's dwelling again at Jaitavada outside of Kosala. And there's a drought, there's no rain. And, and so, and it, it, he, there's even sort of, um, and what move, motivates him is that the, the pool of Jaitavana, so the, 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 the pond in this grove where he was staying became, um, had dried up and the fish and, and turtles buried themselves in the mud and the crows and hawks came down and pecked at them and picked them out of the mud. And the Buddha seeing this felt compassion and decided it was time for it to rain. And so how did he make it rain? Well, he, um, so he says, um, when, we'll just read it here, when uh, the next day, when the night grew day, after attending to his bala needs, he waited till it was the proper hour to go to, go to his alms and then girt round by a host of the revenue. Notice the language here. This is more archaic language. So this is an older translation than the newer ones by Bhikkhu Sujatu and Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, this, this translation, I think, is by Chalmers. It, was, it says up here, it was done in 18, 1895 or something like that. So I was girt round by a host that's so surrounded by a bunch of monks, is what we would say, um, and perfect with the perfection of the Buddha, went into Om on his way back to the monastery in the afternoon. He stopped upon the steps leading down to the tank. The John, tank means a, a pond. John, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, can we go back to Angulimala? Yes. And yes, let's go back. Anyway, uh, let me just. Time, which is a great. Okay. okay. Um, but this story, this this story gives another um, uh, deed of deed of truth, where the Buddha makes it rain simply by standing on the steps of the pond and saying, "I would, I am about to bathe," and that causes it to rain. So look, here we are back at Angulimala. Um, so, any question, uh, Hosen, do you have a question? No, I don't have a question, but I want to go back to their initial encounter and okay. that encounter really presents where, I mean, the incredible acceptance without any kind of judgment towards this 
killer on the road. And Angulimala meets the Buddha and where he was at in this moment completely changes, transforms him. And right. he completely recognizes his past life and ready to move forward with releasing all attachment and the Buddha receiving him. I think that's that's incredible. It's really yeah. presents an example for where all of us can meet in a given moment, a situation, a person that can awaken us. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to express that. And then the situation with, yes, the mother, again, the mother in her experience uh, also completely received the words of Angulimala. Mm -hmm. And was able to, yeah, completely find peace and happiness. Yes. yes, thank you for that. And and let me point out that the very next notice that the very next thing that happens. What what's the next thing that happens? So after this experience with the mother and seeing her suffering, he becomes fully awakened. It says, then Angulimala. So this is the very next thing it says, then Angulimala, living alone, withdrawn, and so on and so forth, soon realized the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. And then the next paragraph, he understood rebirth it is ended, the spiritual journey has been completed, what has had to be done has been done. There's no return to any state of physics. So these are the exact words that the Buddha declared upon his awakening. So notice that this, this occurs immediately after this encounter with the woman. And why do you think, why do you think that is? What do you think the, the idea is here? Compassion, the power of compassion. Yeah. And who's speaking? Is that uh, Michelle? Michelle, yes. That's that scene. That exactly. That's that's my understanding of it. So he experiences real compassion for the first time, and that sort of was the final step for him. That was the final step for him, so that he can become fully awakened. So a lot of people traditionally, this sutta is seen as teaching. Um, compassion, emphasizing the importance of compassion. You know, I was struck by the same thing that was just brought up in what you just said, John, is in other religions, it would be called grace. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a sinner, and then you, by the grace of God, good things happen to you. Mm -hmm. But in a Buddhist context, it's karma, it's cause and effect. And so it seems like what you don't see here is what Angulimala did in past lives to, to merit this kind of thing, because it's not just anyone who walks up and runs into the Buddha, has a chance to even run into the Buddha, and then hears the Buddha, and then understands and listens, and then takes it through to enlightenment. So the whole idea of cause and effect, karma, yeah. really kind of weaves through this to me in a mysterious kind of way and not in the way people usually think of, you know, I do something bad. It's, it's not instant karma. <laughs> it's many lifetimes karma or else why would a, a sucker like him deserve to be enlightened? <laughs> he cuts off lots of fingers and he gets to be enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? well, don't, don't try that at home, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, Unless you got a good karmic buildup, I guess you know if you got a lot of money in the karmic bank. Then yeah, well, I it. think I think that actually is very. Um, that's probably how Buddhists would explain this: how this was possible that he had built up good karma over many lifetimes. He had this sort of backlog of great karma that that kind of was sort of um, activated at this particular point and made this possible. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Uh, or else it doesn't make any sense from the, you know. Yeah. Why does the world work that way? Why does some jerk who cuts off fingers, murders whole countries or whatever, mm -hmm. get that? And those of us who work seem to be living a good life, struggle and suffer. 
Yeah, Michelle, did you have something else? I thought no. I thought I saw a gleam in your eye. <laughs> no, I was just thinking it was a good observation that karma, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. is kind of the mystery of karma. I mean, karma is supposedly the most difficult thing to understand. No, that's what, that, Buddha, exactly. Yeah, only they, the gets it, and um, very subtle. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but yeah, Buddha says this time and again, karma is unfathomable, unfathomable, unfathomable. And notice, notice what happens to his karma as a result of his enlightenment. Right? So the final, so final episode in it is where he, so he's now fully enlightened. He goes into the town to beg and he gets pelted. You know, the, the citizens recognize him. Mm -hmm. This here's this, here's this guy who was who was terrorizing us. And now he's a monk, you know, uh, <laughs> this, you know, begging, begging for food. And so they, they throw sticks and stones at him and he comes back to the Buddha and says, oh, look, you know, look what they did to me. And he says, endure it. You're experiencing in this life, the result of deeds that might have caused you to be tormented hell in hell for many years, many hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and so still seems like a good deal though, doesn't it? He got he, he cut off lots of fingers and he yeah. just gets hits with a few sticks and stones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, he's so, really built up some karma. Yeah, he, his so his enlightenment. In his 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 karma is re dramatically reduced as a result of his enlightenment. So this is how you get rid of your karma. This is how you escape your karma. If you're worried about your karma, then meditate. <laughs> Anybody else? I think we're ready to turn it back over to Hosan. Oh, There's just uh, just one thing, Michelle. Uh, John, I would like you you and I to work on on the word filth. <laughs> we'll look at we'll we'll look it up. You know. Yes, let's do. <laughs> and we'll look we'll look at some. Shall we go back? Um, yeah, it's it's very kind of I don't know uh, it's not demean, the degrading <laughs> or something degrading. Um, let me. I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna. I can't navigate to the Pali text very easily from here. But but we'll look it up. We'll look at this is this is Sujato's translation. Mm -hmm. There's Bhikkhu Bodhi. There probably three or four other English translations. So we'll see. We'll see how different people have translated this word. Let's do. And then Michelle. And then yes, it's time. Yeah. Oh, it's just, um, there's a very well-known statement that if you uh, want to know what you did in your past life, look at your present situation. And if you want to know what your future life's going to be uh, like, look at what you're doing now. Uh-huh. Okay. Nice. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And what are we looking at for next our next meeting, John? Next time. So I think that we will look at these two suttas here at this point. And so this will be on the um, on the handout that I'll send out. And the first one is this is um, I read I read a paragraph from this at the beginning of this session and this is the, I read that's this is where that description of the Buddha came from. And I thought it might be useful to read this because it gives a, a it um, presents it describes in a in a fairly concise, way the path the different the different the different practices of the path and so i thought that would be good at this point and then there's this other one advice to rahula i'll think about that rahula was buddha's son um and but but um it, anyway that's that's i think that's what we'll be doing next time wonderful thank you so much for today john and everyone mm -hmm. and uh, we'll take a seven minute pause and those of you can stay with me to do meditation. I'll share a text up there and we'll do a 20 minute meditation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.